so we have a representative in-house counsel, Nishi Akhil from Fatma Group. Um, we have a Supreme Court advocate, Haris Azman from Kilam Law. We have a consultant to the Attorney General's Office of Pakistan, Nia Shaur Evans. Um, we have, amongst other things, commercial arbitration practitioner, Adil Bandial from Bandial and Associates. Um, and we have our very own SICA Steering Committee member, Kofal Anwar, a litigator with an academic view on international arbitration, uh, and Kofal Anwar, a Fazbekani advocate. So, I think how we want, this is less of a substantially heavy panel, so we're not going to be very heavy on arbitration law necessarily. Uh, we want to showcase everyone's experiences, so I'm just going to dive into it and they're kind of going to take it from there. So, what have your ex arbitration journeys been so far? I'm going to start with you, Koma, because you're nearest to okay. me, and also you can co-moderate the panel, panel with me, that would be quite helpful. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. I would... Hi everyone, I would like to especially thank uh, Magnum Saab who is still with us even though he's had a very long day beginning from quite a lot of cases at the Supreme Court. So thank you very much and thank you to everybody else for staying up till now. We've had a very good audience for today. So I would like to begin by sharing my experience from arbitration that actually started from litigation. So this was in 2016 that I worked with Mr. Faisal Siddiqui and Mr. Munir Malik. And I was assisting Faisal Saab in a case that involved challenging the validity of the arbitration agreement. And it was a first instance case before Justice Shafi Siddiqui. Currently, it is under appeal, so I do not know the status of the case. So my thesis with arbitration, um, which is also there in my book that I'll be talking about later. I, uh, I'll definitely be asking you about that later on. Is that arbitration is often a first step to litigation. So my first involvement with arbitration started from research, and that intrigued me to understanding arbitration in depth. Where did you first hear about it? Because what I hear from a lot of young lawyers here is that they're very well acquainted with litigation and court procedure, um, but not as much with arbitration, especially in Pakistan. So the first time I heard the word, in fact, of arbitration was through Faisal Saab when he said that this case has been Faisal uh, Nakhvi, Faisal, Faisal Siddiqui, Faisal Siddiqui. Okay. and he said, you know, it's a 2013 matter, GM 12 of 2013, and everybody has failed miserably, so the onus was quite mm -hmm. high to meet his expectations, um, and he does quite a lot of research, so that was the first time mm -hmm. I got introduced to arbitration, and he gave me, I remember exactly six books to read on arbitration, and um, by reading over time, I realized that as much as of a challenging area of law it is, it's also very interesting. And uh, after preparing a 50 pages research note, which gladly he appreciated, so that boosted some confidence to delve into arbitration even further. And then in 2017, I got awarded the Shevning Scholarship, and I went to the London School of Economics and Political Science to study Master of Laws program. There I had two subjects on arbitration, fundamentals of international commercial arbitration and advanced international commercial arbitration. So gladly I received a distinction in fundamentals. So and yours has been quite academically. Absolutely. And, um, and thus was born your book. Uh, exactly. Um, I actually wanted to clarify, especially to the younger audience over here, a lot of people come to me and ask how can we get involved in arbitration. And for many, the concept... We'll cover that a bit later. Yeah, yeah. so I, just briefly, I just want to touch upon that my academic side of arbitration is purely because I'm not an arbitrator. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get involved in arbitration through writing and newspapers and, of course, my book. So I wanted to make the most of my knowledge of arbitration. So when I came back from London, I started writing my book. So, and inshallah with Maldum Saab, given how famous of an arbitrator he is, I'm looking forward for more opportunities. Uh, even if it is through arbitration matters, well, hopefully being a this event thing. will kick off something. Absolutely. For sure. um, Harris, I just wanted to move on to you. What has your arbitration journey been so far? I know we have a few dissenters, arbitration dissenters on the panel, and as much as I don't want to give them any time, uh, we do. We, they do have the right to be heard. Uh, so Harris. Not, not really a dissenter, but 
to, I just focus uh, because we have a pretty large Pakistani audience as well. I'll just pretty much focus a little on the domestic international arbitration and how the domestic international arbitration has failed over the years. In fact, recently I've started advising all international companies or all multinational companies to not go into arbitration and maybe remove the arbitration clause. And the reason for that is why domestic arbitration has miserably failed because the, one of the purposes of going into arbitration is that it can be a speedy mechanism of dispute resolution. But in Pakistan, if you go into arbitration, it is twice as long as, a, as probably a civil trial. And so just to clarify, it's less the substance of arbitration that you think no. uh, is causing the dissent, but more the procedural no. obstacles. I'll explain what happens if there is a, an arbitration clause in an agreement, in, a, in any commercial agreement in Pakistan, if there's an arbitration clause and you'd like to invoke it, how do you invoke it? Initially, if the party, if the other side does not amicably agree on an arbitrator, you have to go to a civil court for an appointment of an arbitrator. That proceedings can take as long as a civil trial. And once an arbitrator, after a long time, is appointed by a civil court and the arbitration does take place, the enforcement of an arbitration is again through the civil court by making it a rule of court. So my, and that I'm talking about, if from invocation to it becoming a rule of court and then there are challenges, it's about five to seven years under a normal arbitration invocation. So a party would be much better off not to have the arbitration clause and just go and if it's a, if it's a normal commercial dispute, just file a breach of contract case because this is where our law is lacking. Our Arbitration Act is 1940. And maybe at the time it was a valid law and it was a, a piece of uh, a revolutionary piece of legislation. But in 2019, uh, uh, clients are much better off not having the arbitration clause rather than and going to the civil courts uh, because it, it's going to take twice as much the time. It's going to take twice or thrice the um, the cost involved in it as well. So that's my take on the commercial domestic arbitration. Okay, well, just to give a slightly rosier outlook after we've heard that, I'm going to skip over to Shore and then I'm going to come back to you and uh, to Adil and Nishay. Shore, uh, would you like to let us know what your experience is at the Attorney General's office representing the state of Pakistan in arbit arbitral tribunals has been like? Yeah, thank you, Shay, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, so. Just as everyone else talked about over here as well, before I came to this office, before I, before I was even aware that there is a unit which is called the International Disputes Unit at the Attorney General's Office, I had no idea about international arbitrations. I have no shame in admitting that. And uh, when I did come over here, um, I found out that Pakistan was involved in seven cases, seven live disputes. And I was joined by just one other colleague of mine who was my boss, Mr. Ahmed Adpan Islam. Shortly after I joined, I was joined by another colleague, Azam, and the three of us uh, carried on the office. And uh, right now, as we stand, we have over 60 disputes in which the state of Pakistan is involved. Now, I think it would, it would just be fair for me to describe what the unit does and what sort of issues that we deal with, what sort of international arbitrations that we deal with, or disputes generally. So we have three streams of work generally. The first is uh, that of investment disputes. And investment disputes are treaty-based disputes. We have three current investment disputes pending right now. We, the biggest chunk of our work, or the bigger chunk uh, of our work, is uh, that of commercial arbitrations. We have uh, more than 20 commercial arbitrations which are pending involving the state of Pakistan, as well as other governmental agencies um, which also um, which also encompass many areas uh, or many other divisions such as Ministry of Power and, and Petroleum. Um, the third aspect of our work is of course the, the, the nature of the, uh, what we like to term as a national security matters. We deal with a lot of public international law work and it's absolutely a great and a fantastic experience to be a part of this unit where you deal with, fat, with really interesting issues. You wake up one day and you go to the office and you find out that you haven't to, or you would be working on a matter which is all over the headlines, uh, at the, uh, all over the world actually, not just in Pakistan. So arbitration, in my experience in arbitration, um, just being over here also has to do with the sort of responsibilities that we have at the office. 
uh, the International Disputes Unit and um, all which compose the unit right now are supposed to have four distinct responsibilities and mostly at the same time we have to keep on wearing and taking those hats off at the same time. We work as civil servants, we have administrative duties because it is a government office after all. We coordinate with different ministries in, um, with relation to all of these disputes that we have. We also have the in-house lawyer hat. We, uh, of course, outsource work. Uh, I might jump in on that, the in-house uh, lawyer. Um, just to jump in on that, so we do have an in-house lawyer, Nishe, and um, I think we were discussing this earlier outside, why you think arbitration is suitable and why you think it might not be suitable for certain transactions that you've worked on. A little bit about myself before I sort of mm -hmm. jump into that question. Um, my first meaningful interaction with EDR was um, at my grad school, at the uh, School of Industrial and Labor Relations. And so I specialized for two years um, in dispute resolution, worked with the director of, at the Shanman Institute of Conflict Resolution. Um, and because my, my school was a labor school at Cornell, we did a lot of work with uh, labor arbitrations. So what I really learned from their concept that I will be touching upon in answering your question is the repeat player phenomenon. Um, and so why arbitrations, particularly for Pakistani companies, for projects based in Pakistan, might not be suitable. So that's where my um, first meaningful exposure happened. Worked at um, a firm in um, Lahore um, on two arbitrations, an LCIA for, uh, it was an issue of uh, invoices and uh, delayed payment, and a pre-arbitration sort of stage where we were advising the client when you know, their other party starts posturing that they might be sending a request for arbitration. And so now, just quickly moving on to the in-house bit, sort of a full circle where now my main responsibility uh, in working in the international projects team is to sort of um, educate each and every person in the company as to how they can avoid um, getting the company or getting their department in a situation where they have to deal with a contractor. That has to do with the language that they're using in their emails, um, the kind of negotiation that they're doing. So coming to your question as to you know why it might not be suitable. Just so you know, we will be countering that. Sure, well, I look forward to that. I'm ready um, for the counter. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing, that's why we're here. Um, so talking about why it might not be suitable, the perspective that I'm really approaching this question from is that of a Pakistani company setting up a project in Pakistan. And my question is, why are companies signing these contracts with dispute resolution clauses um, that are resolving their disputes through international arbitration? And I can think of two broad reasons. The first one is that the company that they are entering into that contract with that entity is a foreign entity. Secondly, their lender or the investor is foreign. So it's understandable where the comfort of this foreign entity um, needs to be catered to, right? They need to have that comfort that they're fully conversant with the dispute resolution mechanism um, and they understand the procedure. Uh, for example, if you have a foreign uh, lender for a typical greenfield project, for a power project, right? Uh, contributing 75% to the operating costs, right? When you have a 75%, 25% equi debt equity ratio. And so, in the event that there is a dispute or there's a default and they want to sort of step into the shoes of the project company, you know, or there's a dispute with an off-taker, they feel more comfortable with international arbitration. But my, my problem really is that when you think about those um, advantages, when you think about the cost, and when I think from you know, putting on the hat of the in-house counsel that Shaw talked about, most companies don't realize that their costs associated with not just paying the arbitrator, right? We never think about paying a judge when we go into litigation. But you're also paying the, but we're also thinking about paying the, um, the institution, the arbitral institution. Uh, we're also thinking about costs that are associated during the uh, document production stage, during the discovery stage. Uh, we are thinking about flying our witnesses. Now, these are not costs that you know typically come to your mind. You're thinking about your foreign counsel. Um, also, the matters might be technical because I'm talking about more projects, whether it's fertilizer or power. The issue might be technical, but the claim might be modest. And so that's where the additional cost comes in. On so, that point, I'm going to jump in because we're a bit short on time. Um, 
I, I remember you guys were also discussing uh, multi-tiered dispute resolution clauses outside and I think I'd like to refer that question to Adil. Um, you and Nishe were discussing the benefits um, and otherwise of multi-tiered re dispute resolution clauses. So if you could shed some light on that, please. Um, so just by way of background, before I get into that question, um, my experience with arbitration started uh, uh, in, 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 in the chambers, actually. I, I started working at um, Cornelius University, which is a law firm in the hall. And um, I was lucky in the sense that when I joined, there were a few arbitrations that were uh, with the firm at that point in time, so I got thrust into it. Um, and so my experience in Cagna from there, I had the honor and privilege of working under the instruction of Kimuli Khansa for one arbitration. Uh, also, then subsequently with Paris Lumen Abra Salam Saab and the Khalid Saab, all of whom played a pivotal role in at least uh, you know, ex explaining how to approach arbitration. And in that sense, I think it's a very unique uh, sort of practice as compared to domestic practice or domestic courts. Um, in my experience, and more particularly with respect to uh, dispute resolution process, I, I've fortunately or unfortunately only uh, participated in arbitrations which relate to the power purchase agreements or the energy purchase agreements in the power sector. So I've done about seven. And all of them contain a multi tier dispute resolution. Um, so Nisha was talking about the costs that are associated with arbitrations. I, I couldn't agree with her more. Because when you talk about a power purchase agreement or any sort of foreign contract where you have either foreign entities or even domestic entities which agree to foreign arbitration tribunals, you are looking at a very expensive dispute resolution process. Just to add on what Adil just said about the multi-tiered arbitration clauses, initially Temur also touched upon it. I've seen in most commercial arbitration, especially in construction, there is always an engineer's decision before you can go to any arbitration. So that is one expert determination where most arbitrations could be avoided and parties might, in, before going to arbitration, can go to an engineer and get his uh, word on it. Um, Adil, just to touch upon what we were discussing outside again, we were briefly speaking about the difficulties with enforcing foreign awards. Right. If you can give your comments on that so, really briefly. Right, right, sure, very briefly. Um, so I agree with what Kumal said. Like, ideally, arbitration, and then what Haris also uh, acknowledged, uh, arbitration is definitely the need of the art, and there's, def there's definitely a need to reform the way the system is working in order for this the arbitration system to be accepted uh, at a large scale in Pakistan. And um, I, I would like to add to what uh, Harish said, not only is there a dispute resolution center that's been set up in the civil court in, Park, in, Lahore, in Punjab, but there was also talk of designating specific courts uh, to resolve specific ADR-related issues as well, and Chinese investment-related issues as well. So perhaps one initiative can be if there's an arbitration uh, award that's brought in for enforcement to not expedite the process, you designate a particular court and have to move the proceeding as quickly as possible. Those are all practical steps. As far as enforcement is concerned, I think uh, right now, recently, there's a judgment that Justice Aisha Malik Saiba authored uh, along with Justice Shai Jameel Saab, in which he uh, Orient power. The Orient Power Judgment, in which he's talked about exactly what a foreign award is for the purpose of the 2011 Act. And she somewhat questioned the applicability of the Hitachi Judgment uh, in today's day and age, especially since Hitachi relied on the 1937 Act. Um, and she said that because the 1937 Act has been repealed by the 2011 Act, and the provision in the 37 Act which um, excluded arbitration agreements governed by Pakistani law um, from the applicability of the 37 Act, because there's no such similar provision in the, in the, in the 2011 Act, there's enough reason for the courts to at least believe that a arbitration agreement governed by Pakistani law can potentially also be a foreign award for the purpose of the 2011 Act. Um, and she has enforced uh, that award through the 2011 Act at the High Court level. Um, and she also set aside the tie side judgment in the 2000, 2012 in the hall uh, and added to the tie side 2 judgment in the 2018 MLT Karachi judgment. 
So um, I think in that sense, as far as foreign wars are concerned, the enforcement has perhaps, there's an inclination of the courts to sort of make, it, make enforcement of foreign wars much easier than it had been before. And I think that's a very positive step for international commercial arbitration yeah. mm -hmm. disputes, um, especially parties like these power companies mm -hmm. that have jurisdictions that are the high court. Yeah, so because the jurisdictions. Yeah, yeah, because the jurisdictions of the high courts. So it's 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 a good confidence building measure. Hopefully, um, things would move in a positive direction in other aspects as well. Great, um, Nietzsche and Shore, if you have any final comments before we open the panel up to questions. Um, just sort of linking back um, to why, I mean, I agree with everybody on the panel. You know, there are certainly a lot of advantages of arbitrations. But at some point, we do need to think where it might not be suitable, right? So when I'm talking about the repeat player phenomena, for example, it's not just the cost that's associated that might be problematic. When you do have um, foreign investors or lenders or you know, foreign entities, they're not just investing in Pakistan. They're investing in a whole lot of countries, dealing with a whole lot of um, individuals and parties. And so they are much more experienced. They know the arbitrators in the sense of um, they are on their panel, you know, they are consistently um, selected or um, you know, pushed um, to be selected. So what really I'm trying to get at, particularly from the perspective of a local company, is that you might not be able to take that advantage. Um, because you do not have that sort of um, experience in international arbitration. So that's something that I, that I feel gets overlooked um, because this phenomenon was proven in, the, uh, in labor arbitrations, particularly because your employer is somebody who uh, is much more powerful in terms of you know, the power dynamics, um, is dealing with arbitrations you know, on a regular basis and regular, I mean, obviously much more consistently than an, uh, an employee. So that's where sort of my reservation comes in, not to say that arbitrations are uh, unsuitable, I'm just saying they may be. Can, uh, I, so that's can I give a quick comment on that? So one of the key elements of arbitration is party autonomy, which means that parties can choose their own arbitrators to decide their dispute. Hence, if the question is that we do not have um, good enough arbitrators or we do not have good understanding of the arbitration and hence internationally people might have an edge. So I think it's just not the international arbitration that is involved. There is domestic arbitration in which parties can choose domestic arbitrators and especially because of the key element of party autonomy, nobody is forcing them to choose an arbitrator forcibly. So I, I believe that party autonomy gives a significant edge do not basically choose the governing law of another country or arbitrators that can be domestic or governing law that can be Pakistani to give a uh, fair mm -hmm. uh, chance for parties to participate in arbitration without the threat of any um, the opposite party having an edge in understanding the arbitration. And lastly, I would not like to uh, take much time, but I have written a book on fundamentals of international and domestic arbitration. It's available at Pakistan Law House, and I'll be very grateful if you all can show some support for my book. Thank you. Definitely. I, I mean, I know she has uh, quite a lot of expertise, so I definitely recommend giving it a read. Show her final comments yeah. in three lines or less. Yeah, <laughs> just, just a quick word. Um, I just encourage everyone. Um, as I said, I didn't have any experience with international arbitration. I was thrown into this field. And it's been a very enjoyable and a very, very uh, thrilling experience. And the only thing that you have to do is just try and gain exposure. And there are a number of opportunities here. There are a number of law firms trying to practice international law, or, uh, which are involved in international law. There is the Office of the Attorney General as well. I would just encourage everyone to be interested in this field. Don't lose hope. Don't lose hope by the fact, uh, by anyone's comments, that uh, just, because just because there is not a lot of it happening doesn't mean it's not there. Happening. There is, of course, a dire need to develop domestic capacity. There is, of course, a dire need to keep costs low as well at the same time on part of uh, companies as well as states. But at the same time, we do need domestic capacity. We do need to be able to address these issues, address all of these arbitrations, and address all of these uh, concerns ourselves. And that is perhaps one of the reasons why we have this gathering today, so that everyone can take away uh, the fact that, of course, just try and get more exposure and don't lose hope and be involved in it. Uh, does anyone from the audience have any questions for the panelists? Can we get a mic to the lady in the front, please? Uh, 
Harris, do you want to start with brief answer? All the retired judges are arbitrators now. <laughs> <laughs> and they're on their own. There's no, I, I'm not aware of any formal uh, group or anything that there is one. But if we want, for example, in most arbitrations, uh, we have to give our own names as well. Then we go and personally uh, I will reach out to judges or senior lawyers who are available or experts in that field. And from personal experience, I know that most retired judges do offer, on working on the civil commercial side, do offer this facility. And once we've gone to their offices for arbitration, we've seen that they've associated young lawyers with them who are assisting them in arbitration. Yeah. So one way of learning from the arbitration side would be probably to maybe get in touch with a retired Supreme Court judge. And I've been, I've also <laughs> heard in Madhum Sa, but second on that, it pays really well too. <laughs> And, and the other way is, I think, to affiliate yourself with an organization that's hosting this conference, I think, uh, or sponsoring it. Mm, certainly. Use yeah, it for all the networking you can milk, yes. definitely. Yeah. And there are a lot of other arbitral institutions offering internships. So like Singapore International Arbitration Center or London um, Center of International Arbitration. So you can perhaps apply for an internship and then get exposure to meeting arbitrators and understanding arbitration. And like Shore said, there's also the AG's office you might want to get in touch with. Yeah. And just a very quick comment on that front as well. You don't need to have had some background or some formal education in international arbitration. What makes you, or what should make you an ideal candidate in this practice of international operation is your understanding of the general legal issues surrounding Pakistan. So it's it's obviously very useful for any person to get into international operation after having gained some substantive understanding, substantive experience in the practice of Pakistan, whether that's litigation or transactional practice. That is what is going to get you further, and there are a number of opportunities. There is the Attorney General's office as well. Yes. Any other questions? Satya? Yes, um, thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to congratulate the panel. It's extremely interesting uh, for, for me also to have the insight uh, you know, from people who are practicing from pa in Pakistan, and especially the different point of views that were exposed. I thought it was terrific. Um, I, I actually had a, a quick comment, if I may, um, in response to one of the questions that were posed, and also to yeah. what you said, uh, in terms of access to international arbitration for lawyers here in Pakistan. Um, all of the organizations that are actually supporting here that are on the banner have, uh, you know, online groups that welcome membership, which is for, and especially for the younger generation, that is free. And so access to knowledge and in international arbitration, and I'm responding here to the comment that was made on the bias that there is against arbitration about people who don't know how to, you know, use it, and then they, they think, oh, we're not going to be a game, you know, we don't want to get into the game because we don't know how to, how to play, you know, the rules of the game. Or access to, to knowledge is actually out there for you all. 